Welcome to our review on the electrolysis of solutions. So what we've previously looked at was electrolysis of molten salts. And now what we need to go on to is to look and see how we use electrolysis with aqueous solutions. The first thing we need to understand is something about our electrodes. Now, quite frequently, what we will actually use are what's called an inert electrode. Now, inert electrodes are really important because they're not changed during electrolysis. And we usually make them from unreactive metals like copper or platinum. Or if we're not going to use an unreactive metal, we'll use graphite. So first of all, let's have a look and see what happens when we actually carry out electrolysis on water. So water is a partially ionized substance. So that means it's got a small concentration of hydrogen ions and small concentrations of the hydroxide ions present. So we will represent that by the equation there that says H2O and liquid. Then we put the reversible arrow symbol in and then we've got hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, both of which are given the state symbol of AQ for the aqueous solution. Now what we can do is we can take each of those ions in turn and see what happens. So if we have a look at our hydrogen ion first of all, then what we can see, those hydrogen ions are going to be attracted to the cathode because hydrogen is positive, the cathode is negative. So four hydrogen ions, when they come into contact with the cathode, will gain the electrons. OK, the four hydrogen ions pick up one electron each. So the four electrons there. And as a result of that, we will make two molecules of hydrogen gas, H2. If we then consider what's happening at our anode, then the anode is positive, hydroxide ions are negative. So the negative hydroxide ions will then lose their electrons when they come into contact with the anode. And as a result of that, we form two molecules of water, H2O, and oxygen gas. Don't forget to write in our four electrons as well, because they can't just cease to exist, remember, they are just being transferred. Now, if we move on to consider solutions. So if we've got an aqueous solution, we will have obviously the ions from our dissolved ionic compound. But in addition to those, we will also have the hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions from the water it's dissolved in. So as a result of that, we're going to end up with competition at each electrode. And what we find is only one ion will be discharged at each electrode. So in order to work out what's actually going to be made at the anode and the cathode, then we need to remember these two very important rules. First of all, for the cathode, it's going to produce hydrogen unless ions from a less reactive metal are present. In that situation, it will be the metal that's being produced. Now, the way that we know that is by using the reactivity series, which is shown on the right hand side there. So what we can see in red in brackets, we've placed hydrogen within there. Anything that comes beneath hydrogen is less reactive. So copper, silver, gold and platinum. Now, if we have copper, silver, gold and platinum actually present in our solution, then it will be those metals that form at the cathode. If we have any of the metals above hydrogen, then what we'll find is hydrogen forms at the cathode. So as opposed to having to learn the entire reactivity series, which is a bit of a silly thing to try and do, then if you just remember that copper, silver, gold and platinum form at the cathode, anything else that you're given in the question, hydrogen forms at the cathode. If we now consider our anode, then our rule is quite simple. Oxygen will be produced at the anode unless we have a group seven element present. Now, group seven are called the halogens, and they are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. So if any of those ions are present in our solution, that is what will be made at the anode. If none of those are present, then oxygen is produced. So just to illustrate that point, what we've got here are five different electrolytes. So these are the solutions. So if we have a look at our top line, first of all, we've got copper chloride. So our cations, the positive ions present, we have copper and we have hydrogen. Now from the reactivity series, we know that copper is less reactive than hydrogen. So the product at the cathode will be copper. 
In terms of our anions that are present, we have chloride ions and we have hydroxide ions. Now, chlorine is in group 7, therefore that will form at the anode. If we have a look at the next one down, our copper sulfate, CuSO4, then the cations, again we've got copper there, so that means that will form at the cathode. But in terms of our anions, we have our sulfate ion and hydroxide ion. There's nothing from group 7, therefore oxygen forms at the anode. And that's the same as you go right the way down. You can see that any time that in our cations we've got an element that is less reactive than our hydrogen, then that forms at the cathode. Otherwise, like with our KBr there, potassium's more reactive than hydrogen, so hydrogen forms. In terms of our anions, if we have a look down, it's only when we see one of those group seven elements, so in the first row and in the third row, we've got chlorine and bromine, those are the only group seven elements, therefore they form at our anode. All of the others, it will be oxygen. So just make sure you remember those rules and then you'll be able to predict what's going to be made at either the cathode or the anode.